My name is Andy Falco Jimenez. I'm the owner of Falco Canine Academy. We actually have a corporation called Falco Enterprises, Inc., uh, where we have done a number of things involving dogs over the years, uh, including training police dogs, bomb dogs, narcotics dogs, and uh, uh, eventually got into the pet dog training as a result of all the work I did with, uh, with law enforcement. What got me into dog training was when I was a child, uh, my dream was always to be a whale and dolphin trainer. Uh, I live very close to SeaWorld in San Diego, uh, and that was my desire as a kid. I, uh, we had a jacuzzi, and I couldn't understand why I couldn't have a dolphin as a pet, because we had a water source, right, that we could have kept them in. Uh, my parents denied me of that opportunity. So as I got older, I never lost that desire to train animals, even though I had become a magician for a short period of time, a juggler, and then eventually became a police officer. And uh, I, I had no idea that when I got into police work that it would put me right back into animal training. I, I quickly found um, the police dog unit and uh, only after a year uh, of being on the police force, I was in the canine unit as a, as a canine handler. So it happened very quickly. Uh, it was my passion and so somehow my passion uh, dictated uh, my career as a police officer. Uh, my philosophy of dog training kind of stems from my work as a police officer in, a, in the canine unit. I uh, went to a, a trainer who's still very popular today um, that used very harsh methods of, of training the police dogs. Um, in that day, and again still today, they use sticks to hit the dog, uh, cattle prods, uh, they'd sharpen pinch collars so they were really pointy and then would gouge the dog in the neck. Uh, it sounds very bad. I, I just it, it's it's very prolific in that field. Uh, when my dog was actually uh, harmed uh, in training because he was being hit with a stick and shocked with the cattle prods, uh, I walked out uh, with my dog and refused to continue training uh, at that location. Went to my um, uh, my supervision there at Anaheim Police Department in California and said, I'm not doing this anymore, and, uh, I, and I'm not getting out of canine either, so we're going to figure out how we're going to do this differently. I was very upset, very angry. Uh, they weren't used to seeing that side of me. So uh, the good news was they knew that I was very good at what I did. They had already seen that I had a passion for it, uh, that I was making a difference in the other dogs in the canine unit with my uh, philosophy of training and things that I was already developing on my own. And um, the good news is they, they gave me the opportunity to lead the canine unit from that point on. And so um, because of that, uh, that opportunity, I chose to travel throughout the world to learn from some of the best dog trainers in the world and learn how not to use force and fear in a way that was harming the dogs and created a, a system of training a police dog that was more based on a reward-based training. And it, it changed everything. It changed the way we were training dogs in our area and began to spread across the United States. Uh, dog training has taken me all over the world. Um, uh, it, b before I wrote my first books, which actually really got me on the map, uh, I was already being seen as, a, as an innovator because I had started one of the first SWAT dogs, uh, you know, units, the, the SWAT dog training to get the dog onto the SWAT team, which is high, High engagement with very dangerous people, in a, in, but you also have to be stealth and quiet at the same time, uh, which, which you needed some really specialized training with dogs because much of the dogs we have are very high energy. Now to take that energy and, 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 and kind of train the dog to harness that energy while we moved from point A to point B so we didn't get found out by the uh, very dangerous suspect is a whole different way of training. We used to uh, and still do you know, hype the dog up and get him energetic to go in to hide, find somebody, where this was the opposite. We needed to bring the dog down. Uh, and so because I was doing that in a stage where nobody else was doing it, that really kind of got me on the map in law enforcement. Uh, and then also not using the harsh methods. It was very popular to, you know, it was believed that the stronger the dog, the harder you had to hit the dog to get him to respond, which is, is exactly the opposite uh, in the long run. You know, the, there's... There is uh, a very powerful training method in withholding what the dog wants to do and just waiting him out. At some point, he will realize that I, I can get that thing that I want and, and do the thing that I want in a very um, a strong method if I wait, if I give obedience, if I sit and wait, if I down, if I do all these other things, which in the past we would say, oh, we're going to beat the dog until he lay down. We're going to beat the dog until he sits. You see, you, you still get the same thing. Right? It, it's not that it doesn't work to beat a dog until he complies and then you do it. 
but the mo motivation from the dog is entirely different. If I can get the dog to understand that if he just holds it and waits and, and does it to please me, and the moment he does that and pleases me, I will send him to do the thing that he wants. It's a completely different mindset. You get the same result, and I think actually you get a stronger dog, you get a dog that actually does it better because his head is a little bit clearer. It's much easier to do something out of motivation than it is to do it out of fear. Your, your mind is clear as a human being. It is no different than the dog. And so that kind of starts the, the, the talk about how my method is completely different than other people in law enforcement. And then it, it transitioned into uh, helping people with their pet dogs. Uh, and I do the same thing. So some of the places I've been because of my dog training is uh, uh, places like uh, Northern, uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, where we have a facility where we get our dogs uh, for detection work. Seems very strange that why would you go to Northern Ireland? But uh, there is a trainer uh, out there that I uh, respect uh, very much who also breeds dogs. And he has bred some of the best dogs that we've been able to use for detection work. Um, the Slovak Republic uh, is a place where I get most of our police dogs that do search and rescue or biting uh, and, and uh, you know, the patrol part of dog police dog work because they breed really strong dogs out there uh, in the uh, the very um, uh, very important way of breeding where it's more concerning about the way the dogs work as opposed to the way the dogs look. Uh, and so there, it's very important for a dog to have all the working traits that are necessary to do whatever job it is that they're supposed to do, in this case, doing police work. And so it, it's not that they don't care about how a dog looks, but that's not the most important thing. Here in the United States, we tend to look at how dogs look and then we breed them so that we have really good looking dogs, right? And that's just, that's just a fact and an unfortunate situation. But you're, you're not looking into the genetics of the dog and, the, and um, how the dog works. So I've been to the Slovak Republic for that reason. Of course, Germany, um, uh, the Czech Republic. I've been to Poland, uh, Hungary, uh, and all the Eastern Bloc countries of, of Europe. And so that has been fantastic. We have a facility in Argentina. Uh, one of my trainers that came to me, he sought me out because he thought that uh, our method was one of the best he's ever, he's ever seen. So he came and began to hang out with me and, and actually volunteered his time. Uh, and uh, now he's one of my lead trainers and actually my instructor now. He surpassed me. Uh, it is not, off, it is not uh, uncommon for the student to become the teacher. And so he is now teaching me some very important things in relationship to dog training. Uh, we've trained dogs in Peru, uh, of course, Canada. Uh, which I love very much. I'm a huge hockey fan, so I love to go to Canada as much as I can. And so I've been all over, uh, all over Canada uh, uh, in relationship to dog training. And uh, all over the United States. I've probably been in every state of the United States because of my dog trainings. So in addition to training uh, police dogs for law enforcement and uh, military, uh, didn't mention that, we've trained dogs for the, the Marines, the Navy, uh, and the Army. Uh, we've trained dogs for um, special forces to find cell phones. Uh, cell phones are used to, uh, um, uh, to, um, to set off bombs and explosives in the Middle East. And so there was a, a strong desire and need for cell phone detection dogs to search the caves and locations and, and prisons where there were cell phones and very successful in that. Um, we've had people who have a strong allergic reaction to peanuts. And so we've trained dogs to alert um, people that are allergic to peanuts to the presence of any kind of peanut uh, of any sort, whether it's a candy or a, um, uh, uh, an oil-based uh, peanut. And so um, one of our, our peanut detection dogs got us into uh, National Geographic where we, we competed against a power washer out of Detroit. And uh, in the, the, the concept for that particular um, episode was that a, uh, sorry about the ringing doorbell, uh, is, uh, is the, um, the power washer could clean things so well that the dog would not be able to detect peanuts. Uh, and so we were able to show that a dog can, uh, and our dog did, uh, find a plate that had uh, peanuts uh, residue on it regardless of how strong the, uh, the power washer was. And so we won that competition. So some of the other dogs we train, uh, one of the most popular ones we train now is for bed bugs. And so we've trained probably a hundred bed bug detection dogs that help uh, pest control companies uh, and individuals who uh, just want to make some extra money and work for uh, hotels. Um, some big hotels in Las Vegas have bed bug detection dogs that work on a regular basis to make sure that the, uh, the rooms are clear of bed bugs. But very popular, uh, people, some people are making a heck of a, a good living uh, from dogs. Uh, we have some people that have five of our dogs that are working every day doing searches 
uh, for bed bugs. Um, of course, you have your uh, uh, mold detection dogs, your you know therapy dogs for people that have anxiety, um, search and rescue dogs. We had a dog that worked 9/11 uh, exhaustively, and actually the handler now is having some difficulty because he spent so much time at Ground Zero uh, with his dog that it's caused them some health problems. And that dog has since passed away, uh, probably because of the exposure to all the things that happened there. But so mm -hmm. that is a that is a very common thing that we've done. Um, Oh, you know what the most odd one is the E. coli salmonella detection dog. Uh, the phone call that I got from the uh, state of California was uh, uh, the, um, the head of the Department of Public Health uh, called me one day and asked, <clears throat> can you ta train a dog to um, detect E. coli salmonella? And I said, well, what, I need to know what leads to E. coli salmonella. Uh, what is the thing, what is the component that the dog needs to be trained on? And he says, well, the only thing that causes it is fecal contamination. And I said, let me just get this right. You want me to train a dog to find fecal matter? It's something that dogs do every day <laughs> as you go for your walk. They stop at every place that has fecal contamination. And he just kind of laughed. He said, yeah, uh, we need to do it you know, on command, and we need to know when the dog finds it on produce, lettuce, uh, cilantro, you know, celery, uh, tomatoes. <clears throat> and I said, I think I can help you with that. And so we uh, did a four-year project with the state of California, UC Davis, training dogs to... Um, to alert to E. coli contamination. And um, we were quite successful. The dogs could find um, the amounts at, at below 0 0.01 microliters, which is microscopic. And the dogs were able to do that on a 70% uh, basis uh, of success. Really, really powerful. It actually taught me more about detection dogs than I already knew. I knew a lot about detection dogs, but this kind of put it over the top. The dog's nose is, uh, is incredible for doing that. So lately, there has been a huge emergence of, uh, of therapy dogs and, and service dogs that um, uh, people are using for uh, emotional support dogs, to PTSD, to uh, you name it, uh, anything that has to do with uh, mostly emotions. Uh, we've known for years that dogs have this uh, connection with human beings. And, uh, and there's been many studies that dogs actually reduce blood pressure uh, from uh, being with them, sitting on your lap, to petting them. Um, they cause you to be more social when you take a dog out for a walk and uh, just having the dog present allows people who would normally be a little bit shy can be uh, a little bit more social because of the presence of the dog. So they do have a very positive effect. That's, that is the, the, the great thing about dogs. Uh, it, but nobody really knows why, the, the, how the energy is transferred or why that actually happens. There's been a lot of studies done, but I'm not sure we really know why that happens. It, it, could it be the, the fluffiness of their coat or their personality or the way that they lick you in the face? You know, it's probably all those things mixed in with a bunch of other stuff. But in reverse, the dogs know a lot about you. They are, they are masters at reading body language. They are masters at understanding when you're in a good mood, bad mood, you're sick, you're angry um, and sad. And dogs pick up on that almost the moment they see you and probably even before that. And so, that's what makes them good dogs in, uh, in, in the case of alerting people to a change in you know, what's going on with them. So in the case of a diabetic whose their blood sugar begins to drop and, their, and what's going on with them begins to change, a uh, dog picks up on it right away. So a dog that uh, is well connected to a human being based on, 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 on just simply the dog understanding the human being, they will begin to get closer when you begin to get into a dangerous point with your blood sugars. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to train a dog to be a, a diabetic alert dog. Uh, you need to have a dog that has a good connection to you, and you need to be trained on how to recognize when your dog is telling you that he's concerned about you, right? That's completely different than a detection dog searching for something, finding it, and telling you that he found it. Two different things. A dog will have a natural reaction to the change of your body condition. And sometimes it's going away, sometimes it's coming closer, sometimes it's licking your face, sometimes the dog will bark at you. But knowing what that is with your dog is what's, what's powerful. Uh, and so a dog connecting to you is, uh, can be a very important life-saving thing uh, for some people. Uh, dogs also can sense that you have a, a growth on your body that's cancerous. They can begin to lick it, then show attention towards it, they'll smell it uh, because of their senses are, high, are much higher than ours in regard to that kind of stuff. And so again, that has to do with the dog's connection to you. Uh, in some ways, if the dog doesn't like you, he's not going to tell you crap because he doesn't care, <laughs> right? And so, but if a dog like, loves you and has this connection, they're really quick to alert you to those types of problems. 
Uh, one downside to all of these dogs that are being called therapy dogs is that there's people bringing dogs onto planes and into restaurants uh, that are, bring, are doing that with dogs that are virtually untrained in regard to obedience. And that could backfire uh, uh, for some people that really do need those dogs. And so hear about it all the time in the news where people are bring, now bringing chickens on planes because it's their therapy animal or lizards, or I, I heard some pretty crazy stuff. I think a peacock was the last craziest one I heard on a plane. Um, and so that's kind of led into this other issue, right? There's always people that take advantage of something just so they can, who knows, why would you want to bring a peacock on? I don't know. Uh, but um, at least if you're gonna have a therapy dog or a service dog, have it trained properly to be an obedient dog that can be around other people and knows how to sit still and be good in a restaurant or on a plane or in a bus or on a train. At least have your dog trained to do that kind of stuff well. But um, it really has become a little bit of a problem, I think mostly just because uh, everybody wants now to travel with their dogs and, and hang out with the dogs because they don't, maybe they just don't like people, which is, you know, I understand that sometimes too. <laughs> I love people though. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that's what's going on with therapy dogs and, uh, and service dogs. So the, uh, our philosophy on the hierarchy uh, and, and understanding that in regard to being a good pet dog owner and uh, understanding how your dog operates is an important one. And it's becoming more important in, in the way that we're shaping our program, which is, is now called the Human Dog um, uh, Transformation System. Uh, we, what we're trying to do is transform the relationship between humans and dogs. And in many cases, we're able to transform a human uh, because now they're understanding how things work a little bit better in not only the relationship with their dog, but relationship with their family. And I know that sounds very strange, but there, there are, um, there are uh, connections between the relationship between a dog and the relationship with children and, and wives and husbands and all kinds of stuff. However, uh, dogs do things differently. And sometimes we want to humanize dogs. So at the same time of understanding it's still a relationship, relationship you have to understand in a relationship how the other person or other thing is different than you, right? And so that's important to know that the, uh, the dog needs a leader, right? There are some people that just want to, uh, you know, let a dog in and allow it to do whatever it wants all the time. What they need to understand about the dog is dogs live in packs. Uh, you know, their, their, their genetics comes from living in packs and they, they want to live in a pack. Uh, but a dog that's been domesticated uh, the way that we've domesticated always needs a leader. There's not many dogs that can handle leadership because that's not how we've raised them over the last several thousand years of dogs being on this earth. We've taught them and trained them and bred them to be followers. And when a dog who's supposed to be a follower is now put in this leadership position, like on a walk, um, some people can act like I'm very afraid of everything that's coming towards me. I'm afraid of another person with a dog coming towards me, so they, they choke up on the leash. That's telling the dog that you're afraid. Right? If you slow down when you see somebody approaching you, that's telling the dog you're afraid. If you change your voice from being really happy to, uh, okay, slow down, and your voice changes in its tone, that's telling your dog to be afraid. That's telling the dog, I need you to be in charge because I'm too afraid to handle this situation. The dog doesn't do well in that situation. And so now the dog becomes fearful himself, becomes overreactive, growls, barks, and then sometimes even bites because it feels like, I, I gotta handle this because my human's weak. All right, so um, that was a long-winded uh, uh, way of saying that understanding that a dog, in fact, needs a leader is going to help you understand that now you have to change your, change your ways. You have to show your dog that you are a leader when you're on a walk. You have to show the dog that you're in charge, that you're not afraid of those things approaching. So that's one example of understanding how we are different from dogs, that a dog always needs a leader and you always need to be in charge of the walk. You need to be in charge of the dog inside the house and you need to have this, this, uh, this, this sense of leadership that the dog can love and respect. What I quite often compare um, ownership of a dog to is the Christian religion. And now this isn't a religious talk. It's just if you look at the Christian religion, they look at Jesus Christ as the leader, the end all be all. He's always watching. He, he has provided everything for us in our life. That's the philosophy of the Christian religion. The dog must feel that you are the Jesus Christ in his life, that everything comes through you that you are to be feared in a good way, not feared in a bad way. Uh, you are to be respected and you are to be loved in a way that is ab above and beyond anything else. And that means that uh, maybe even sitting and waiting at the door as you pass through the door first, or understanding that the bowl and the, and the food in it is yours. And that would be in relationship to dogs or bowl aggressive, 
or food aggressive, right? A dog growling at you for the food is not acceptable, right? That dog must look at you as the provider of the food, that that food actually belongs to you, and that he's thankful that you're giving it to him. Uh, that has to do with toys in relationship to kids. The dog must always feel that the, the kid, uh, the child in the household, is, is not uh, somebody that he can bite, growl out, or snarl at because of, of the hierarchy within the, within the home. How do I determine that the dog trainer that I'm deciding to go to is um, a good trainer or a competent trainer? Uh, and um, a lot of people don't look at that. They just look at the ad, they look at the price, they, they look at the proximity of where they live, and they choose a trainer based on that. Well, that's not always the best thing, unfortunately, uh, because the dog training world is uh, virtually unre unregulated. There's nobody that gives anybody the ability to be a trainer based on you know education, experience, or anything. You or anybody else could say, today I'm a dog trainer, and now they're a dog trainer, and can begin to charge money for that. Um, and so there's a, a lot that has to be um, vetted out. Uh, in, uh, in a lot of ways, you have to find out what the history of this dog trainer is. Where, where was he trained? Um, who did he follow? Uh, what training methods does he use? If he only uses one training method, like food uh, and a clicker, uh, you may not be in the right place because what if your problem with your dog and your relationship with your dog is not best solved by a click and treat type of trainer? Uh, somebody may need to understand some other ways of training in order actually to make that relationship good. Um, what if they only train with a pinch collar, which there's many trainers that only use a pinch collar. Uh, well, that's not going to work with a dog where the pinch collar actually makes your problems worse uh, because you're using a very um, strong system of training that hurts. And if you're using it in the wrong way, that could actually make your dog more aggressive if aggression is your issue. Uh, it can make your dog even more fearful uh, with a dog that has a high, um, uh, actually a low pain tolerance and a high level of fear, right? That actually will make your problems worse. And so you want to make sure you go to a trainer that has a lot of different uh, tools in his toolbox. Uh, you know, the dog, he, I can use a click and treat. I can use a, an electronic collar if, I, if it's one of those things I think is going to be good. A pinch collar. Um, we use flat collars. We use all kinds of different choke chain. We know how to use them all. Uh, I tend not to use um, much of those methods, but I do know how to use them all if it, if it comes to a need to do that. So finding out if they have more than just one trick in order to train your dog is really important. Um, find out what certificates they have, uh, make sure and ask for testimonials, make sure and ask for references, uh, and really do your homework. You, you're not going to be able to go to a trainer and believe that he's the best just because he says so, uh, because there's a lot of people that are not doing this job very well. Uh, just today, read an article about a guy that was a, a organization that was charging $25,000 for diabetic alert dogs, and the dogs were uh, virtually not trained and people were paying $25,000 for a dog that had no training. Uh, they claim the dogs were 100%. No dog is 100% ever because they're attached to a human being who is not 100%, right? They're trained by trainers who are not 100%. So this animal, it's impossible for that dog to be 100%. They said the dog would not only alert to the uh, levels of, uh, of sugar in the blood, but the dog would also uh, get their medication and the dog would also dial 911. This was all on their website. And the dogs were going to their new owners at three months old. That's like saying that my four-year-old, Bo, uh, could be a police officer. Impossible. Uh, I love the boy. He's smart. He's fantastic. But he would never be a police officer. And I would never be able to train him to do that when he's only four years old. So you can see how this can is really an important aspect of, of, of knowing that it's an unregulated system. Uh, the dog world and that you have to do your homework uh, and find out uh, more about the person you're choosing to train you and your dog. Um, what I want to make sure and let anybody know that's interested in being a dog trainer, we have a great program right now that's just getting launched uh, and we do still have some early bird uh, space left for people uh, and that is the human dog transformation system where we're training dog trainers how to use our system to uh, not only make a difference in people's lives and create loving and respectful relationships with people and their dogs, but also to make a really good living as a dog trainer. Uh, those two things can actually go hand in hand. Uh, there's been a, a long period of time where dog trainers think they can't charge that much, that they're gonna, they're gonna have a hobby that they get paid at and that kind of stuff. That is not the case. If you are a leading expert in the dog world, uh, much like I was able to tell you that I've traveled all over the world because of what I've been able to do with dogs, and you can, you can do the same thing, 
this is what this system is going to train you to do to make an impact all over the world with dogs. It doesn't matter if you want to be a dog trainer, if you're a dog walker, a veterinarian, a groomer, the, the information you're going to get in our program is going to help you be a better dog person in all of those aspects of, uh, of the, uh, the dog industry. And again, it'll allow you to charge a little bit more money because you're going to be uh, the best of the best uh, with that program. So uh, again, just go to Falco Canine Academy on Facebook and you'll see that we have uh, ways of getting you in there. Some important things you need to know when you have an issue with your dog and you want to try to uh, either stop a bad behavior or create a good behavior is the, uh, the tendency now, especially today, is to go on YouTube and watch a couple videos or watch uh, you know, a TV show with a famous dog trainer on television and then try to replicate what's happening on either one of those videos. Um, and the, the, the problem with that is that the dog that they're training on that video is not your dog. Uh, and it, that human that's training with that dog is not you. Uh, and that's a very important aspect that, that, that um, the personalities of the dog and personality of the dog are, are an important uh, thing that a trainer needs to look at. How do those two things work together? Because this dog uh, in the hands of the wife will act completely different than in the hands of the husband. That happens all the time. That the dog will be obedient to one and not the other. And will come when the husband or wife says, here, the dog turns around and comes back. Uh, the, uh, the other spouse says, here, and the dog runs away faster, right? That's just a fact of life. And so that's kind of that same thing. You're watching a video based on a human being that's not you and a dog that's not yours. And obviously, uh, and quite often another breed. And so you really need to uh, uh, look at it for a professional, again, going in and finding, you know, what their history is, um, what their, uh, you know, if there's any testimonials or people that you could ask about what they got out of that dog. And again, finding somebody that knows how to use a lot of different methods of training is going to be really the important thing. That's going to tell you that they will find the one that works for you. Super important, which would be us. Uh, there's not many trainers that do what we do, <laughs> so it's going to be hard to find. But um, there are some out there. I've I've ran into some some really good people recently that really understand that aspect. Um, be careful about going to uh, the vet, uh, not the vet. Be careful about going to the um, uh, the pet store and asking the person that works at the counter, uh, "My dog's not healing. What do you suggest?" And they quite often go to the pinch collar. Um, sometimes your dog's not healing because of a reason that's going to cause uh, your problem to become worse when you add that pinch collar. They don't tell you how to put on the pinch collar correctly. The pinch collar is a tool that needs to be on uh, a dog in the right way and fitted in the right manner uh, in order to make it work. You can actually cause damage to your dog's skin if it isn't put on correctly. An electronic collar, although it has a really bad, um, uh, you know, a lot of people think it's a really horrible device. Uh, in some cases, it may be the most humane and best tool that can possibly be used. Uh, but also, if it's used wrong, it could be the worst tool on the planet for a dog and cause, again, more problems than anything else. Uh, same thing with a bark collar. If it's not fitted correctly and used correctly, it could make your problems worse. So just going to a pet store and just going to the, the clerk and saying, what do you suggest for my dog barking? Oh, let's get the bark collar. Uh, again, may not be the very best thing. So you got to get help. You got to find a professional. Uh, we are uh, available for uh, uh, phone consultations and internet consultations. I'm not trying to point everything towards us, but we can help you make good decisions and, and, and in many cases won't even charge you for it. We want to help you have a good relationship with your dog and you need to uh, you know, find the right people to help you do that. There's some great tools out there that could do some great things, but you have to make sure that it matches who you and your dog are. And so um, those are some of the easy, quick, things that you need to, to know. Um, I could actually add one more. Uh, I want people to be careful about dog parks, and that has come up a lot lately, that everybody wants to go to the dog parks and let their dogs socialize and have fun and that kind of stuff. Uh, the problem with the dog park is that you want to you wanna make sure that you're not there at the wrong time when somebody that comes with a dog that should not be at the dog park. Your dog who at this time does not have any problems with their dogs, uh, it, you know, runs into the wrong dog, will now suddenly have problems with all dogs because you went there at the wrong time uh, and experienced the wrong situation with a dog that now attacks your dog and harms your dog. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've got from dogs that are now aggressive because of the visit that they had last week at the dog park. So you just want to be careful. I suggest that people get uh, uh, you know, a group of people that have dogs and, and do a doggy date where everybody has control over their dogs and there's specific rules about you know maybe we start first with dogs on leash 
to help introduce the dogs. And then as the dogs begin to show that they can get along and have a good time, then like you would with children on a playground, let them play together, but you monitor it very closely until you're sure that all the dogs that are there get along and that you know what dogs don't and how to handle that situation. A dog park has too many unknowns. It has a lot of uh, people that, uh, that come there that shouldn't be there with their dogs at that time. So it's just a really one, an important one that I wanted to mention before we, uh, we ended this conversation. The best way to, get, uh, to find out about us right now tends to be our Facebook page. It used to be our website. Uh, you know, websites for companies aren't as, uh, as visit, visited as much as, uh, as face, Facebook pages. And we do a lot of stuff on our Facebook page. I do a lot of Facebook Lives. I do a lot of training on our Facebook page. So you just go to Falco, letter K number 9, K9 Academy uh, on Facebook. Just search Falco K9 Academy. You'll find a lot of other pages that are related to Falco K9 Academy. That's because we do a lot of different things. But our main page uh, is Falco K9 Academy and you should get all the information you need, all the phone numbers, our location. Um, you can ask questions on Facebook, no matter where you are in the world. We have huge following in South America, uh, all the way to Australia and over to Europe. So uh, we will uh, answer any questions you have right there.